Hi, it's Whitney from the 3D Printing Today podcast, also known as Shakespeare on the Thingiverse. And this is the Heatwave Julia Vase by Vertox. I think it's one of the most spectacular 3D printing objects that you can find on the Thingiverse. And when I first saw it, I had to know how to make it. It took me a while, but I figured out how. Vertox only says that he used custom software to create it. I figured out a way to do it with free open source software you can download and try today. So if we cut a cross section through this object, we can see that each layer of it is composed of a fractal outline. This is a Julia set fractal and we can pretty easily generate those with a piece of software called Chaos Pro. Okay, so here we are in a program called Chaos Pro, which is a fractal generation program. And you can see on the screen here, I've got a Julia set. Now I've got it set to produce white interior and black in the exterior. And it takes a little bit of tweaking to set that up, but you can figure that out. Now, any fractal equation like a Julia set uh, has a couple of factors that you put into it. In this case, the Julia has two seed values that you put into it. I have 0.25 and 0.4 is the second seed value. And those very small changes in those numbers uh, make huge changes in the image. So you can see, for instance, if we take 0.4 and change it to 0.45 or 0.46, you can see, you know, if we go up to the very small changes here, if we go up to point, say point 0.6, the whole thing will probably disappear. Yeah. So point 0.4 is about where we want to take it to. Um, there's infinite varieties of shape that you can get by changing these two values and also changing the power factor down here. So all we have to do is create a stack of these 2D fractals and then turn them into a three-dimensional object. And that's what I'm gonna show you how to do. We wanna start out with, let's see, we'll start out with a value like that. Um, that's fairly simple, not a whole lot of detail, but still an interesting shape. And then suppose we work our way up to 0.4. Yeah, we'll work our way up to 0.4 like that. And then maybe go back to that and go to negative 0.4. That'll look cool. Okay, so we need to generate a couple hundred images to make our model. And luckily for us, there's a animation feature built into this program, which makes that quite easy. So we'll set this as our first value and hit add first, and we're adding a keyframe. Then we'll go to 0.4, and we'll add another keyframe. Then we'll drag that key second keyframe down to make sure we've got yeah, 100 frames between them is pretty good because that's going to determine how many layers we have in our model and, and basically how much detail we have in it. So we want to do it pretty nice. Now take this and make it go to negative 0.4. And you see how that reversed there? It's going to give it a nice, real nice sort of swish to it in the, in the model. Um, we'll make another keyframe. Keyframes are a little bit clunky in this program. You can't edit them after you've made them. You can edit their positions, but you can't edit the values that you're keyframing, which makes it a little bit hard. You can't go back and fix things after the fact. We'll change this back to zero to go back to this at the end. I'm trying to set everything at 100 frames apart uh, just so we have, we'll end up with nice symmetry in our parts. You don't have to. Um, you can you know, create things however you want. Um, but this will make a nice symmetrical part. Okay, and after you've got all your keyframes set, you just need to look at some other settings here. Spline interpolation is nice, and you want to say save as pictures. So we're saving individual files rather than saving a video. 
you can also determine the height and width of your frames here. We're going to use relatively low resolution there, but you can certainly jack it up. It just takes longer to render. And you say start, you give it a location and give it a name. We'll just go over this old one. And it starts rendering and it's going through and creating a stack of images. So each one of these is a two dimensional image made of pixels. And our next step is to take each pixel and extend it into the third dimension and turn it into a voxel, a volume element instead of a picture element and stack them all together and make a three dimensional object. Now all of our images are rendered to this file and I like to look through them and just make sure there aren't any surprises. Um, sometimes if your values aren't quite right, you can get really weird frames showing up in there that aren't going to render well, but everything here looks pretty good. So the next step is to turn this into a three dimensional model. Now we're gonna use a program called ImageJ, which has been around for a long time. It's used for medical imaging. Uh, the easiest uh, way to get it is to get an install called Fiji, which stands for Fiji is just image J. So we're going to uh, import image sequence and just grab the first frame and click OK, and it'll load all the images in. Once it's finished loading, we'll start to turn it into a 3D model. So ImageJ is quite a remarkable program. It's used a lot for scientific and medical imaging. Um, so it has the ability to read all kinds of different formats and perform all sorts of different operations on them. It's kind of like a Swiss Army knife for graphics programming. In the plugins menu, you'll find 3D Viewer. So we want to make sure that we're using the image stack we have. Just load it in. Make sure that we display it as surface and pick a color any color other than none or black we'll pick white so it'll be easy to see uh, threshold of 50 is fine resampling factor determines how much of the data it dumps so at a resampling factor of two it's basically making a, a two by two square and averaging over that so the higher resampling factor the more data you're dumping the lower resolution your final model will be that's useful if you're dealing with really big files, but I think we'll be okay with two here. If you have a resampling factor of one, then you're actually going through and sampling every pixel. Depends on how big your images are, or how much computing power you have. Okay, and that was real time. I didn't pause it at all. It generated an image rather quickly. And if we uh, scroll it around, you can see that's a pretty neat looking, uh, pretty neat looking thing we've got there. Now, by default, uh, each layer is, is turned into one unit of height. And so basically, your, your each pixel, one by one pixel, turn, gets turned into a one millimeter cube, basically, which explains the proportions. And we can fix those later when we bring it into Blender. So we'll go File, uh, Export Surfaces, and export it as an STL. So now we have our model in Blender, and we can see that it's got a pretty chunky surface texture here. That has to do with um, the fact that we're just dealing with black and white. We're not anti-aliasing. So basically you're getting jaggies in every image and that is uh, reflected in our final mesh. But never fear, we can go in and add a smooth modifier, which will take care of that. Clean it up nicely. Let's try 10 iterations on the smooth. That's pretty good. It's not perfect. Um, I gotta say, it's not as nice as Vertox's models. Uh, his software is doing a really clean job of, of rendering it. And this uh, approach that I'm showing here is kind of a brute force approach of going through voxels to, to render it. If you did this at a higher resolution, you'd end up with a nice, cleaner, crisper model. But this will do for demonstration purposes. So we'll apply that just so we don't leave it hanging around. And now we can do some shaping on the model. If we want, we can uh, stretch it 
a little bit. Scale, scale Z, maybe stretch it up a little bit so it looks a little bit more elegant like that. All sorts of different ways you can play with it since it's a mesh in Blender. If we wanted to make it uh, you know, more tapered, we could shrink the bottom of it, make it bigger, but that's easy enough stuff to do. Now we'll just turn on some basic lights that I've preset so we can see what it looks like, and we will render it. And there you have it. It's a very simple uh, Julia vase. You can create things of infinite variety with sort of technique. They all have sort of elements in common, but they can be very different from each other too. You can run the, the Julia set to the point where it breaks down into multiple parts and then bring it back together again and you end up with holes in your pieces, which is, looks really cool. Vertox did a whole bunch of vases like that as well. And there's other things you can do where you can make the image break down entirely and create really rough, almost random looking shapes. I'll show you one of those. So this is actually a Mandelbrot set rather than a Julia set. And instead of changing the seed values, I'm changing the power value. But you can see you get this crazy, very broken down uh, shape. It looks almost like a piece of very weathered driftwood or something. You can see um, not everything is this sort of elegant Art Nouveau shape. You can come up with really crazy organic patterns like this one as well. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Uh, keep watching the YouTube videos and make sure to tune in to 3D Printing Today podcast if you haven't checked it out. Thanks.